you for watching Mary Videocast. And if you are listening, Mary Form Radio. These are programs of the Florida a &M University's Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative, where we uh, carry out the legislative intent of educating Floridians and minority communities about marijuana for medical use and the impact of the unlawful use of marijuana. I am Angela Hardiman, Public Affairs Liaison, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Patricia Green Powell, who very, just absolutely pleased to serve as this interim executive director. We are here to educate and inform, as Ms. Hardiman said, and we are pleased that we can do this uh, during a pandemic. We have continued okay. our services and, and information that we want to share with you. We've, we have not missed the beat, have we, Dr. Green Powell? We missed the beat, yes. <laughs> All those, we'll let everyone know about where these digital assets lie uh, for your perusal. Um, and I'm just very, very excited to uh, introduce our guest today, Dr. David Berger. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Berger. Absolutely, a pleasure to be here. You. Uh, let me just let the listening audience know the expert that you are. You're a board certified pediatrician with over 20 years of experience as a clinician. Uh, you've developed a national reputation in holistic pediatric primary care, nutritional and detoxification therapies for autism, ADHD, and related disorders. Uh, you also work with women and men who wish to do preconception and prenatal counseling testing and treatments to try to optimize the health of uh, their pregnancy and, the, and their baby. Um, I'll just let them know you're, you are credentialed. Uh, you graduated from the Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1994 and did your pediatric uh, residency at the University of South Florida at Tampa, Tampa General Hospital, where actually you started using holistic therapies. Um, as a team doctor, also uh, you served as team doctor for the Tampa Catholic uh, High School as well as medical director for uh, a summer program run by the Tampa AIDS Network, and also a medical liaison for the Palm Beach County Breastfeeding Task Force. You are everything kids, Dr. Berger. <laughs> <laughs> kids are your business, sir. They are. Yes, thank you so much, so much for joining us. So let's just jump right in because we're in the age of uh, COVID-19 and you know, you're more than just a kid's doctor, you're a doctor. So I think you can speak to how COVID-19 intersects with cannabis use and uh, share with our audience uh, thoughts on that. Absolutely. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, you know, it's a very interesting time for a lot of things, as we all know. Um, one of the things that, you know, has been interesting is this, as an industry, since the coronavirus pandemic started up, you know, the sell, the sale of legal cannabis and medical cannabis has really skyrocketed in the state of Florida as well as across the nation. Um, with our understanding of how well it does for many people with controlling things like anxiety and depression, um, I think that that's played a very um, positive role in the mental health of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's been, you know, and I've certainly had people who, I um, mean, you know, long-standing histories of anxiety or depression, but I've also seen certainly people who are more recently diagnosed because of all of the stressors that um, people are, are under these days, you know, both under the financial stress to the being at home and locked down to be, um, being with your family for a very long period of time without a break, um, you know, that those all obviously pay, play a big role in our mental health. Um, and so because of, you know, it's been very nicely studied now what the effects of um, cannabinoids do on our mental health and on our, from a balancing us out, you know, certainly the, probably the most um, common single diagnosis that I've used in certifying patients throughout the years has been anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, in kids, it's autism, but in overall, but most of the kids have, with autism have anxiety. Um, and so mm -hmm. it does seem as if it's been a, a very big help from that perspective. Um, you know, I, I do certify a lot of adults as well. You know, the mm -hmm. conversation, of course, relative to how one uses cannabis, especially if they're starting to get sick, because one of the other really fascinating things about it is that we know that it's anti-inflammatory. Okay. And we know that why is it that some people who get get exposed to or contract coronavirus has a minimal of no symptoms, but yet other people we know can be a very serious and potentially fatal mm -hmm. situation. 
And what we're now discovering is that the overwhelming reason why pe the people who are getting super sick is because inflammation is really, you know, this, we've heard about this cytokine storm um, that, we, that we're seeing overreactive immune systems to mm -hmm. this virus. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of things that we can do, including the use of cannabis, to keep the immune system under control. Mm -hmm. but not making it immunosuppressed because we don't want to suppress the immune system. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a Goldilocks, not too strong, not too weak. We want it just right. Mm -hmm. Along with a lot of the other things that I've been always looking at, such as maintaining good vitamin D levels above a level of 50 in the blood, um, maintaining good, you know, taking a good zinc um, supplement, making levels around 100 in the blood. Um, you know, there are things like that. Other things that I make a very big part of my day-to-day -day, um, therapeutic approaches, the uses of omega-3 fatty acids, reducing inflammation, other types of things like curcumin and, and um, CoQ10 and quercetin. There's a lot of things that we can do to help balance the immune system without overshooting it. And, uh, and, I, and I suspect, and then of course, this is not anything that's been studied. So of course, I'm making this recommendation or these comments um, as an experienced clinician who has seen a lot and has gotten a lot of good feedback on it. I would love to see more research being done on this. But mm -hmm. those individual things, and, and one of the things that I've really focused my career on is connecting dots. Well, if A can cause B and B can cause C, then is A related to what's happening with C? Maybe for some people, yes, some people, no. But it's clear that the types of supplements that I've talked about through the years have been well studied in terms of maintaining a healthy immunological system. So, mm -hmm. and again, that's where cannabis really comes into a play a big part of that as well. And that's a perfect pivot. Uh, Dr. Greenpaw, I don't know if this was, might be your question as well. Um, but recommended forms at this time, uh, obviously you probably would not recommend smoking as opposed to. Okay. Well, well, first and foremost, I don't recommend, I'm sorry, doc, I'm sorry, Dr. No, no. I said, and she was, uh, Ms. Hardman was alluding to the fact, the administration piece of it, which, which are the best ways now. Right. Right. To get it in the system, yes. Well, certainly as a, as a physician, I don't recommend anybody burn, smoke anything, period, whether it's a cigarette or a clove or a, or a, or a banana leaf. You know, um, smoking something into your lungs is not a good idea. Um, certainly the inhalation as a whole, um, you know, recognizing that with medical cannabis, that it's not really a social thing where a bunch of people are hanging out anyways, which of course, in a day of physical distancing, we really aren't, be, you know, should be doing now anyway. But yeah, of course, yeah. the sheer act of exhalation, you know, when someone sees a plume, whether it's smoke or a vapor coming out, well, if you have the virus, guess what's in there, right? And of course, a person who inhales, um, again, whether it's in a vaporized product or a, or a, or a combusted, a, a burning product, one typically takes a deeper breath. Mm -hmm. And one typically takes a deeper exhalation as a result of that. So the amount of a potential viral load, that's the term that I've really been enjoying using is the viral load. The viral load from just breathing relative to talking, relative to singing, relative to sneezing, relative to coughing, screaming. We know that the amount of virus that w a person who is infected will mm -hmm. exhale depends on how they're doing it or what the exhalation is involved in, I should say. So a person who takes a big ploof of smoke or, or vapor and gives one of those big old plumes that you sometimes see people do, that's going to be spreading things more. And of course, just the sheer act of, again, do I think that if a person has no problems with inhaling cannabis in the overall, and they're doing it in the privacy of their own home for medical purposes, I don't think that they are necessarily hurting themselves if they don't have pulmonary symptoms. Mm -hmm. But I would say if you're starting to notice a cough, which I would recommend for any inf infection, but if you're starting to notice, notice a cough is coming, if you're starting to have even the slightest bit of, of, uh, of difficulty breathing, don't put anything into your lungs. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems like a pretty solid recommendation, mm -hmm. but there's so many other ways that people can use cannabis to get it into their body, to have that anti-inflammatory effect and anti-anxiety effect. That's a perfect caveat. What, what would be your recommendations yes. before Dr. Greenpile uh, jumps in? Right. Well, well, certainly oral forms, you know, um, we know that, you know, now when pe people have to be mindful of the fact that when they swallow it, that THC does act differently in the body than when it's done sublingually or, you know, I tell people kind of spread it around your mouth some and wait five minutes before drinking, you know, topical forms, whether it's transdermal gels, patches, etc. So there are lots of ways that one can get it into their body and get the therapeutic effect without doing something that could potentially, um, compromise because we know that even with what does one of the things that smoke does when a person smokes a cigarette or anything is the cilia the micro hairs that are on the lining of our airways 
can be um, paralyzed. They don't work as well. So, you know, those hairs, which are constantly bringing things back up towards the upper part of the airways that's out of the lungs, there's a compromise there. And that's not what we want to be compromising right now when there's, if there's virus down there. Sure. So, you know, so that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it. But I do think that overall, if not in the inhaled form and sick, I suspect that there would be a net benefit, potentially wow. a very nice, a very big net benefit. Dr. Berger, you can't see me now, but I'm just smiling and shaking my head because you have touched upon, I couldn't write fast enough, the kinds of good information, the good education tips that you just shared with me. Someone who's just recently developed this basic education course that's out there. I touched a little bit on administration, but you just said some things that I can't wait to do another live or a Zoom presentation to incorporate the kinds of things that you just, you just taught me. That's what's so good about Mary. As we have uh, uh, invited guests, learned guests such as, as, such as yourself uh, to, uh, to this uh, forum, we grow in the process because we sometimes, you know, the next one I give them, oh, I wish Dr. Burke were here, he could answer that a lot better than I can. But if you listen to the kinds of points that you've made this morning regarding cannabis, and administration. That's just music to my ears. But I know that we, this is a short uh, segment, short uh, show for us. I've got to get my question in about the uh, pediatric side of it, the kids portion of it. Sure. Uh, we know from the news uh, that schools are reopening really soon. Parents and administrators are um, perhaps grappling and struggling with what they need to know, what to cover. You have done some extensive work, I've followed you, and I know that you uh, have done some really good work. And would you share with our listening audience your level of involvement with schools and yeah. to help draft some guidelines of, of safety and what kinds of things that they need to be thinking about? Sure, and I've actually been in, involved in two different aspects of what we we're just talking about. Um, from a medical cannabis perspective, um, you know, as some people may have heard back in uh, the end of last year, that there was a mandate put forward by the Department of Health for each of the counties of the districts to come up with an in-school usage of cannabis mm -hmm. policy. Um, it does seem as if most of them are moving to the permission as well as finding places for parents to come onto campus in order to administer it. Yes. Unfortunately, that's a big challenge for parents who are double workers, for people who may not have the resources to get mm -hmm. to school to do it. And I think that that's just going to be another one of the things when we look at the social differences that mm -hmm. the, and some of the issues with, between people of means and people of not means, where people of means are going to be able to accomplish things that people of means can't. And, mm -hmm. you know, as we're, as we're so fully recognizing in society, you know, the, of, of between the haves and the have nots and um, and where people are economically, et cetera, and how their health care and all the and how and how they can what they can accomplish in school. This is another area that there's a disparity, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. yes. um, the um, you know, at least it's something. I personally think that if a nurse is allowed to administer Ritalin to your kid, that your nurse should be able to administer now. Could I could I see them saying, hey, we don't want kids vaping in school? Okay. Considering especially with the high schools and all the problems with vaping in school, although I would make a strong argument that if I have a kid who's having an, an, an uh, anxiety attack or a panic attack, the best medicine for that person is inhaling because they'll be out of it in five minutes potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and calling a parent to come in that your kid's having a panic attack, well, your parent's not going to be there in the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, my hope is that we will evolve to a place where school nurses can administer it just like other things. Um, but we're not, I don't anticipate that now. Now, the schools were also, are all supposed to have a policy in place for the fall. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, that happened right before the pandemic. And recognizing fully, and I will not ding any school district or school who doesn't have a policy in place for this for the start of the school year, because the school systems have a lot more to be dealing with right now because of the pandemic and what sure. the heck are we going to do come up in the middle of August. So mm -hmm. I'm absolutely willing to give the schools a pass on if, they, if they don't have this particular thing figured out. But at least it's nice to know that things are moving in the right direction. And again, hopefully they'll have that policy. Mm -hmm. Now, on the coronavirus side, um, I do um, think uh, serve on both the, um, the health and opening of school committees for both my son's um, pro uh, public uh, pro uh, charter school, as well as my daughter's um, private school, as well as our synagogue, um, where both in terms of both the, the religious school as well as the synagogue as a whole. So I have some really 
interesting perspectives. And I'm also bringing all three organizations information together to kind of come up with the best practices. Um, so that, that's been a very interesting thing, you know, from what we hear from what the governor's saying, school's going to be open, you know, well, you um, and that, Dr. Berger, those are, we want to hear that. Yes. Uh, as you can see, it's so much information, right? Oh. Dr. Green Powell, oh but we gosh. do have to go to break. But when we come back, let's pick up right where we left off. If you all will stay with us, we will be back with you shortly. Florida A&M University's Medical Marijuana Education and Research Initiative, or MARI, wants you to know that we take your health seriously. That's why we bring you our neighborhood forums and our weekly MARI Forum radio program. During this coronavirus outbreak, remember, wash your hands often, clean and disinfect frequently used objects, and stay home whenever possible. Please visit our website at mary.famu.edu for more information. Mary, educating minorities about marijuana for medical use and the impact of the unlawful use of marijuana on minority communities. Thank you for staying with us with Mary Video Class and Mary Form Radio. And if you missed the first half of this segment, you might want to rewind because Dr. David Berger has given us a tremendous amount of information uh, as, as a, an expert in this space of with children and cannabis and otherwise. Uh, Dr. Green Powell, it's been very enjoyable, right? No, oh, it's been it's absolutely it's super, super, super. As we, we go into this next half, uh, before we went to break, Dr. Berger was sharing with us his knowledge, skills, and disposition on this whole topic of returning to school at a time where we know that COVID-19 has made us think a, a different way about a whole lot of things. And so our, our, our conversation is centered around guidelines and requirements and what's safe and best practices, what do parents need to know, as well as school leadership need to know about returning to school so that we could keep our most our prized possessions, our students uh, safe and healthy during this pandemic. Dr. Berg, would you continue this wonderful conversation that I am just absolutely, my head's exploding with so much good information. Yeah, and to tell you the truth, the health issue here, in my opinion, is not so much about the kids themselves. It's what they're bringing home, okay? And granted, especially in many households where there's multi-generations, you know, that there could be, you know, living in the same household, um, as well as even people who are not of grandparent age, but of parent age who have health issues. You know, that's my concern. You mm -hmm. know, if there, what if there's, you know, if grandma's living in the house and mm -hmm. she has some immunodeficiency or she's got um, diabetes or blood pressure, they're the at-risk person. And that's my biggest concern in all honesty. I think that overwhelmingly kids seem to handle this fine. Yes, there are rare cases of these very dangerous things, but as a whole, we're recognizing that. And we are recognizing that it does seem as if kids are not the super spreaders that some adults are, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that they can't. And so, you know, being mindful of the exposure that kids get and what they can bring home, you know, but, you know, and being mindful of, you know, making sure hands are being washed and all of the other things. And, you know, but are we going to have to be keeping to physical distancing within our own homes because kids are bringing things home? Right. Sad to say that, but, you know, I mean, let's face it. We, know, we have community and we have families who it's just grandma, right? right. You know, times where, where parents aren't at the house. That, you know, it's a straight setup for potential yeah. bad. And, and you, you touched upon something that I've been saying since I started this position in terms of, of our um, intergenerational households. We know that a lot of our, our young children are with grandmom and grandmama only because mom and dad are someplace else. Right. And so that whole notion and the whole conversation regarding if grandmama is, has been given uh, the recommendation to use marijuana for medical use, kids don't quite understand what this is that's in their household. And you talked about the uh, inhaling the smoke. If grandma has chosen to intake her medical marijuana by that means, you know, students, uh, children are at risk in terms of the, the quality of air. Um, right. I mean, well, I, mean I, I don't really understand cannabis use in that regard. So there is a right. teaching opportunity for oh, students. Oh, there definitely is a teaching opportunity. I don't want to put us off that too much. It's just always been a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, How absolutely. do we get this knowledge to our students about what's happening if they're being raised by grandma and granddaddy who right. are, um, have been prescribed. 
And I question how many of the legislators and the people who are making these decisions are actually taking that into account. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, well, and let's just sure. go ahead and say it, you know, um, make it a little bit lighter. Grandma's probably wanting to whoop some butt too. <laughs> well, right, but, but, but grandma doesn't know who's, what your kid's coming home with. Well, I'm talking about because she's quarantined. And so let's right. go right into that because we've talked about, you know, you know, some of the things we can do once school starts, but we're going to be here, you know, with our kids uh, through the summer. Right. And I was just wondering, Dr. Berger, if you wanted to speak with, you know, some sort of coping uh, mechanisms and things while we're in, because you know, we're all seeing the means. I mean, folks are like, oh my God. I really appreciate teachers now. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, many of us have thought teachers need pay raises, but I think that this even exemplifies that. Triple. It's, Triple. A, it's a resounding yes. Put whatever they want, give it to them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any type of coping me mechanisms or just skills or anything? Well, well sure. And, you know, and obviously different people have different coping mechanisms, whether it's um, in the arts, you know, in music, that's, that's been my major outlet is, you know, and I've been, uh, you know, performing concerts online. Um, I actually just last week did a, um, a it's on, it's on our YouTube channel, um, a concert for, um, social justice and, um, mutual respect and universal love was the name of this concert. Oh, um, you. you know, addressing all of the things that we're going into. And, you know, it's so sad that like something such as health has even taken a partisan divide where it's the maskers versus the non-maskers, which mm -hmm. you would think the one thing we have shown that works in preventing the spread yeah. is a person wearing a mask, okay? And the reason why you wear a mask is to prevent the other people from catching what you have, not just protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so for all of this animosity that's going on, when all if people were just to wear a mask when they're in situations, don't wear it in your house, don't wear it when you're running if nobody else is running by you, um, when you're walking in a parking lot if no one else is around you, but when you're entering into a closed building or if you're entering into a space, you know, thankfully we did see the very large number of people who were attending who are attending rallies. Um, you know, these days, the overwhelming majority of people we are seeing wearing masks. Mm -hmm. You know, so people can be mindful and can be and, and their voice. And their power can still be um, exhibited. And I'm hoping that people will continue to do that because, let's face it, there are people out there who are fighting for their lives and they're fighting for their families right now. And, you know, that's an important thing for people who, you know, this is their life that, 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 that they're fighting for. And we need, and in my opinion, we need to very much respect and encourage that because that's how change gets made. Yes. So but we, are, we all want to do it safely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Berger. Were you going to say something, Dr. Green Powell? No, I, I, I didn't know if on your agenda, if we were going to talk a little bit more about the autism piece of it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, I Absolutely. Quarantining at home with an autistic child is, is, is something different. And I believe that you can, that's one of those special categories for cannabis use, right? Yeah. So certainly cannabis of itself, obviously, if it's helping kid, keep a kid more calm, less anxious, more focused. You know, a lot of people think of cannabis as, oh, dopes you up, space cadet type of thing. Well, certain strains will do that. Certain terpenes, such as limonene, actually give better focus and attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, from a medicinal perspective, that can obviously can be very helpful. Quite frankly, it could very much help a parent cope with the situation at home better as well because of all of the stress that's involved with that. You know, obviously, there are other important techniques. You know, you know most families who with kids with autism, they kind of know their kid. And mm -hmm. so, you know, recognizing, okay, is this just my kid's autism symptoms or are we escalating here, right? Mm -hmm. Just to sure. recognize that things are kind of getting out of control and spiraling, mm -hmm. you know, using proper behavioral techniques, whether it's positive reinforcements and rewards, whether it's the way that we use our words, ways to de-escalate situations, which again, a lot of parents, but not all, have those types of skills for. Those are the, you know, the types of things that we really can be using as, you know, to to help mitigate damage, you know, to help make things as good as possible. I mean, I have some families who have told me that the, the quarantining has been the best thing for them, you know, that they're able that their kids are much more focused, they're not as distracted by things, that they're seeing their kids make jumps that they haven't. I've had other families who have told me this is terrible, they need to be back in their school because that's where, you know, they, they, they realize I'm mom, I'm dad, I'm not the teacher, they got to listen to the teacher, but, you know, I'm not going to kick them out of my classroom and kick them out of my house if they're acting up. So that certainly is, but, you know, keeping to schedules, keeping to routines, of course, we know 
we all probably as humans do better with the routine anyway, but certainly people on the spectrum, um, in, you know, much more so um, than most um, could be benefited from that type of thing as well. So, um, you know, speaking kindly, you know, it's hard for some people to do, but you know what, let's face it, we all should be speaking more kindly all the time. And I think our society would be better for that too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for your passion, Dr. Berger. It yeah. just spills out, doesn't it, Dr. Greenwald? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I, I told you, if you can see my infectious smile right now, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking he really is a package deal when it comes to knowing uh, children, knowing young, young uh, kids to, to help us, those of us who are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles. If you have been quarantined with your child, you know that Dr. Berger is saying all kinds of making important points that you agree with wholeheartedly if you're listening to us now and if not share this message with friends that's what this forum radio is all about as well as the, the uh, video cast uh, the information that we're sharing with you through our very learned guest is just golden it really and truly is so uh, dr berger thank you so much for touching up on that uh, the quarantine with with autism because uh, i i know that this is a message that most of our parents who have autistic children are wanting to know about. So this is wonderful. Yeah. And, and just all of the, the information over, not, not just, I mean, thank you for that for autistic children, but you know, you are, you are in the business of children, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Berger. So how should you, um, why don't you inform the listening audience and watching audience on how to reach you? Yeah. yeah, certainly. Well, fortunately, it is pretty easy to find me online these days. Um, my last name, Berger, with an E. Um, so you probably find me just from that. But our practice is holistic pediatrics and family care. Holistic spelled with a W because we look at the whole picture. Um, my cannabis practice is holistic relief spelled L-E-A-F as a little play in the word relief. Um, but yeah, but you can link to th from one to the other. And also, you know, we, we we are on all different social media platforms, and we uh and we do have our um our um. Our YouTube channel and if anybody goes on that and if you can subscribe we understand if we get a few more hundred we actually get our own name on the on the channel as opposed to just a bunch of random numbers so anybody who wants to uh, subscribe to us and you'll see both speech that I give but also you know um, I share my music with the world and um, and it's been not just a comforting thing for me but you know it started me at the beginning of coronavirus I started twice a week um, putting out just songs of hope and friendship and family and future, um, just uplifting songs. Um, I've definitely, the most recent concert shifted to not as much of don't worry, be happy mode, because I don't feel that this is a, a moment, this is a month of our lives that we can just be saying, don't worry, be happy. I think that this is, this is a time that um, social change is such an important thing. And this is a time to worry about what's going out there. And, and we all should be happy, but we all shouldn't be too happy with what's going on right now. Absolutely. Well, we are uplifted and we appreciate you, Dr. Berger. We uh, will definitely have you uh, back on again very soon. Uh, in the meantime, we want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, and if you missed us, because these, these uh, video casts and, and radio show slash podcasts are also archived on the Mary website, which is mmeri.famu.edu. And I'll go ahead and, and uh, tell you the schedule. We're in 17 counties around the state. We're in Hillsboro, Polk, Lee, Pasco, Pinellas, Bradenton, Sarasota, Leon, Gadsden, Volusia, Jefferson, McCullough, and Duval. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining in. We will so be much. next week. We're signing out. I'm Angela Hardiman, the public affairs liaison for Mary. And I'm Patricia Green Powell, the interim executive director for Mary. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We'll Have see you today. Bye.